So our next segment will not fix everything in our troubled environment, but will pay keen attention and persistent attention to many small actions like Rachel was talking about. All of these will help lessen the crisis. We're beyond the point of ignoring the, the facts. As sailors, we have a very close relationship to the water. And although the things we discussed today may not be really sailing centric, in ecology, all things are connected. We've got reasons to be hopeful and actions that we can take. And we'll continue the discussion with this panel of ocean lovers, uh, Paige, might represent sailors of the sea with high impact and results oriented programs for hundreds of regattas, thousands of classrooms, and in the hearts of, and minds of innumerable sailors. Deborah Hessler uh, followed the guide for sailors of the sea and put forth for producing a sustainable sailing event in a quite challenging environment. Dana Maygarden, research associate Associate Development of Earth and Environmental Sciences from the University of New Orleans brings real world relevant science problems to uh, child, uh, children from K through 12 and college students, teachers and community um, in an area that's facing enormous ecological challenges concerning the ocean. As a matter of fact, today, they are experiencing a um, tropical storm, the first one of the season. Um, Captain Susanna Winder is a chemical oceanographer, and additionally, she completed her master's in emergency management. And me, I'm an old hippie that I took a science class back in uh, 1974 that was presented, interestingly enough, on an analog videotape with a slide carousel for visuals uh, is a very old school virtual. I saw the guest professor only twice during the whole ecology course. And it so impressed me that ever since I took that course, I've lived what I learned there. So let's hop on to the green round table. Uh, you can use the Q and A uh, button at the bottom of your screen throughout the discussion to relay questions. I'll, I'll relay it to the panelists. Paige. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, my name is Paige and I am the program manager for Sailors for the Sea. And I'm here with Deb Heisler and we're going to talk about some ways that you can get involved with our programs and how she's taking them to really awesome levels. We're now powered by Oceana. We merged with um, the world's largest ocean conservation organization a little over two years ago. And our mission is to empower sailors and boaters to become ocean activists and protect wa the waterways that we all know and love. So if you love the water and you want to protect it, we have a really, group, a really great group of um, three core programs. If you know us at all, it's probably for clean regattas. Um, Clean Regattas is a self-certification system that awards regattas around the world um, for different levels of sustainability. From participant to platinum, you can really take it to be whatever you want it to be in terms of how much of the best practices you implement, um, and we offer support in that area. Our next program that we have is Kids Environmental Lesson Plans, or KELP. So this is really great if you're watching, you have kids at home. Um, these are free downloadable lesson plans um, that teach about ocean health. Um, and these two programs sit under our overarching program, which is the Green Boating Initiative. And so this is for boaters, all, all types of boaters, sailors, motorists, everyone in between, to learn about how you can be going green on the water. Part of this Green Boating Initiative is a when you sign up you will receive a free digital download of the green boating guide um, and to, to get that you can visit sailorsforthesea.org slash nwsa I need a little link just for you guys so you can go log on download it it's free um, and then you'll be up to date with everything that we are putting out if you would like to be um, more keen into what we do with oceana and our campaigns which i'll talk about later 
So this is a little preview of the guide. It covers over two dozen topics, um, including how to deal with your black water, how it impacts the environment, um, non-toxic cleaning products, suggestions, how to green your galley. A lot of this we will cover with Deb in the, in the upcoming slides. And again, that website is sailorstothesea.org slash NWSA if you are interested in getting this, this guide. Um, so yeah, I'll turn it over to Deb, who's done an awesome job at really exemplifying what it means to be a green boater. Thank you, Paige. Good morning. You'll see on this slide, we have the five R's. Um, we were all familiar with three of them, the reuse, the reduce and recycle for many, many years. Um, we're expanding now. Uh, I think we've realized that we need to. I too, like De uh, Deb Huntsman, was just an old hippie trying to get recycling happen way back in the 70s and 80s. And you know, I worked in a manufacturing facility and they thought I was crazy when I brought it up to them. But I, I did my own thing. And that's where the power of one matters. So this slide is relative to not only, I'm gonna talk a little bit about provisioning, but not only to what we do at home in our own lives, part of it is you know, just refusing. Refuse to find, you know, find those products out there that are without the not unnecessary packaging and refuse to take that packaging on board if you're a cruiser. Some of the things they may not be without packaging, but look for recyclable at least. So I, you know, I don't buy paper plates anymore. I just don't do them. And those were a staple in my home growing up. We threw a lot of those away. While provisioning, I want you to just be mindful of the packaging. You know, buy your cheese from the deli and repackage it in re reusable containers. So you're not bringing all of that packaging on board. The same goes with your snack bars. Deb Huntsman was on a trip where they took all of the packaging off of those so they didn't get blown overboard and they put them into reusable containers. At home, you know, refuse things like straws. American uses over 500 million plastic straws every day. If you'd like a straw, you know, use the alternatives. Um, but there's paper ones and there's, there's compostable straws. Um, reusing uh, items, you know, look around and see what else you can reuse. For example, coffee that comes in a can, you can reuse that for storing other items on a boat. Um, dish towels versus paper towels. Now that mainly applies to me on a boat. And then reducing is, you know, things like maybe meat, uh, you know, reduce the, the amount of meat that you're eating. Or for example, with the paper towels, I cut mine into half or into quarters. So recycling is all about having a plan. Many locations that you arrive at by boat do not have recycling, so check ahead of time. But eliminate as much as you can beforehand. And then of course, composting is our rot. At sea, we can dispose of food items overboard, but we have to remember that they must be appropriately ground. So here's some examples of the alternatives. Um, you see the, the straws, the recyclable, the reusable bags. When we go cruising, we did um, many, many deliveries. So we had to uh, provision on islands. And we, we just talk our own recyclable, reusable bags. Um, everybody had their own reusable bottle, straws, uh, silicone lids, beeswax down in the corner, the, uh, the beeswax wraps. They're wonderful for products, eliminates plastic bags. So this is just a sampling of this. And then on meal planning, while provisioning, here's some things that you need to keep in mind, you know, simplifying your cooking and your snacks. And this list is just um, not all comprehensive, inclusive, but it's about eliminating your waste, um, canned anything, freeze dried. And again, take these items and put them into reusable containers before you even get on board with them. So we want to eliminate our waste and use up our fresh items first. Okay. Other essentials here are the paper towels. Now I, I tend to use paper towels for sanitary reasons, um, but I use as little as possible. Uh, for cleaning, there are many, many green products. Rachel mentioned them, Paige has mentioned them. When you sign up for that green boater's guide, it's just, it's filled with information. And I really encourage each of you to do that because it's got cleaning product recommendations for pure green, seventh generation. Some of these are familiar to most of us. Um, there's a page that even tells you how to make your own cleaning products. And, and then there's some sunscreens too. So um, insect repellents, again, there's many natural products out there that, that uh, we just want to be mindful about our selection and our choice. And I got to put a plug in for Rachel Miller's Rosalia Project website because it also has links to a wealth of sustainable ideas products 
and other organizations. I encourage you to look at the website, follow the Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Pinterest, um, the little icons at the bottom of that page, and it'll take you to a whole nother world where you will be able to um, get a lot more information and ideas. Uh, the idea as a cruiser or just as an earth citizen is to reduce our footprint. In my backpacking sport, we practice leave no trace and everything we pack in gets packed out. Well, there's a few exceptions to that, but. Awesome, thank uh, you, Deb. That was kind of a little bit of a highlight of what we're seeing boaters do on an individual level, which is really awesome. And so I appreciate Deb coming on to really ex expound upon what she's done in her own boating world. And now um, she also has experience in having these larger events for multiple people. So we are, um, organization that helps run these clean regattas that I bet um, at least some of you have attended. Um, they're around the world. Uh, it's the world's leading sustainability certification for all on the water and near the water, water loving events. We've seen so many different events now come on and say they want to be clean regattas, even if they're stand up paddleboard yoga events. It's really neat to see um, because this is becoming, you know, an issue that all events that are near the water have to have to consider. So since our founding in 2006, over 2,500 events have shown their commitments to sustainability by hosting these clean regattas. And we've reached over 700,000 sailors and attendees in more than 40 countries. It's free, it's a self-assessment tool, um, and it awards certification levels from participant to platinum, depending on a series of best practices. And just as an example, um, there's 20 best practices that you can go through and check off. Um, some of them include assembling a green team, so that's gonna be a huge help. It's probably your first step if you're looking to host a clean regatta. Uh, is having a team of people to support your initiatives. It also includes um, encouraging the use of non-toxic sunscreens and cleaning products and publicizing these efforts to your audience so that they know what you're trying to accomplish. Um, another best practice, best practice is hosting a beach or marina cleanup so that you can get your sailors involved in really seeing what washes up along the shores of wherever you're sailing. Um, and then also eliminating single-use plastics from what you're serving. Um, at the bar, for meals, everything like that. So I'll turn it back over to Deb. She had a really awesome regatta, Buccaneer North American Championships, actually on a lake in Arizona. So this was a really unique example. I think she did a really great job of um, doing all of this, a lot of these best practices um, without even a yacht club. So it just goes to show you that anyone can, can take this program and run with it. Yeah, so what's unique here is that um, we don't have a club. I don't get a staff that I can say, hey, make this happen. We sail in the middle of a desert. It's kind of right back here in the background. And so we have reservoirs. Um, but what we did with, this was our Buck Nationals that we participated in last October. We also did our birthday, a birthday and leukemia cup regatta in February, and that was a huge success. But anyway, part of the um, best practices that Paige mentioned is that we refused and we did eliminate a single use water bottles. You can see up in the top left corner where it says free water. So we, we pull all of our materials out of a trailer that's stored in the dirt also. And so I asked uh, Sailors of the Sea has an idea, of, uh, you know, a model for a water filtration system. And I put the call out at a yacht club meeting a couple of sailors stood up and said, hey, I think I have an idea. We brainstormed, came up with a way to package it in our trailer so it doesn't get destroyed in the process with so many hands moving it. And um, so we have our water filtration system. We don't have single use water bottles. Uh, so, you know, plastic's a problem. It, it just never disappears. So we also gave out reusable water bottles to everyone. We encourage and publicize that there will not be single use water bottles. You know, people bring Gatorade and whatnot. So we did make some of our containers available for recycling. And you can see in the, the right-hand corner that we have signage on all of our big containers. And we use those, reuse those signs also. All of this reduced our efforts. You can see me down in the bottom of the page with that tiny little bag of trash. That was after a four-day regatta with about 50 people in attendance. Then we gave out reusable awards. So those are those nice um, micro, whoops, Rachel, microfiber, I think, but they're a quick dry towel. And then we gave also the beach bags out. So the compost, I work with an industrial commercial facility here in Phoenix. We're a large uh, city, so we have that. 
And one of the things I had fun doing was remaking the signs and our compost signs say, you know, we can't turn water into wine, but we can turn food waste into dirt. Thank you for letting me share. Thanks, okay. Deb. I just want to wrap up with, um, so Oceana has a really awesome track record of getting things done for the health of the oceans by having these three to five year campaigns. Um, and since we've been able to partner with them, we've been able to work with them on campaigns that impact the health of the oceans that sailors might be interested in, in also being a part of. So we're working on right now passing policies to reduce the use of plastic, creating plastic free zones and getting companies to offer plastic free choices. So one of the initiatives that we're working on right now is the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. This act um, is currently in Congress. You can sign a petition in favor of it and it would phase out certain single use plastics that you know, we all often to see in the waters while we're sailing, um, put in place a nationwide beverage container refund program. So a lot of those plastic containers that you see for beverages can be easily refilled and redesigned. And so that's one of the goals of that program. And also just shifting the burden of plastic waste from us as consumers to the companies that are producing it. So if you're interested in this system level change um, beyond just, you know, the individual as a green boater and event level wise and group wise with Clean Regattas, definitely check out the campaign work that we're doing with Oceana. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Deb, for chiming in on all those topics. And thank you all for listening. It was really awesome to be on this panel and um, we look forward to having your questions. Thank you, Paige and Deborah. Next up, we have Dana May Garden. Hi, everybody. I'm very honored and excited to be here today. I'm not actually a sailor per se, but um, I spend a lot of time on the water here in um, the New Orleans area, and uh, we have plenty of it. And uh, so in my job and my personal life, I'm always on boats and uh, canoes and kayaks and things, um, bringing people out onto the water. And so uh, today I'm representing the educational community in uh, Southern Louisiana and the greater New Orleans area. In my position, um, I, I manage the coastal education program at the University of New Orleans. My uh, mission, I guess, is to increase awareness about coastal uh, issues uh, generally here. The topic that resonates with so many people is that issue of marine debris. So I was so excited um, listening to Rachel's talk that was so inspiring um, because I can just give a little local snapshot. This is just a little photo taken, a little snapshot taken on a beach along the shoreline of Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, New Orleans sits on Lake Pontchartrain. And um, as you can see, straws, bottle tops, uh, little bits of plastic. So this was the beginning of a program that we uh, have been working on. Um, my main audience is uh, teachers and students here in New Orleans. And as you can see, New Orleans sits on Lake Pontchartrain. And Lake Pontchartrain is not a lake. It's uh, part of an estuary connected to Lake um, to the Gulf of Mexico. And the city, which famously is much of which is below sea level, has this network of canals uh, that pump stormwater. And it just started raining, by the way. Uh, Cristobal is getting closer. Um, so those pumps that you can see in the image that I'm showing, so one is very close to the bottom of the image, and you can see a canal going back into the city. Those are what uh, pump the stormwater out into Lake Pontchartrain. And then you can just about see the causeway top of the image, towards the top of the image, about quarter, uh, three quarters of the way up. Just past there is the South Shore, or rather the municipal harbor where people sail from. Um, and um, there, are, there are all these canals, there's a bunch of canals that go out into um, the lake. And with them, they bring little bits of plastic washing from the streets. So wherever you go along the shoreline of Lake Pontchartrain, if you just use your eyes, you're gonna see the kind of thing that I showed. So um, I've been working on a, a project um, with the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation. The, the project that I've been working on um, is sponsored by NOAA, and um, it was a grant awarded to the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation. And it's, we brought hundreds of students to uh, the shoreline. We, we really intended for them to learn about a whole bunch of different things about, about the, the shore, basically. But the thing that really uh, became 
important to everybody was the marine debris aspect. We've done, as I say, quite a lot of trips out to this. Um, actually, uh, this is called Pontchartrain Beach. It used to be a recreational area. It's now closed to the public. So uh, bringing students out um, in groups, um, they wouldn't normally be able to go back with their families. So, you know, it's a chance for them to see this area. This uh, image was part of the uh, international um, cleanup effort, the Ocean Conservancy is international cleanup that the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation sponsored um, in last fall. So we had about, I think about 50 people of all ages out collecting debris. This is just a snapshot of our data. That so we used the um, Clean Swell app to quantify our data. So as well as collecting trash, we were you know, collecting data as well. So I've heard, you know, several people already talking about, you know, the, the um, importance of not only cleaning up, but, but collecting science-based data. So, the, so we've used a, a couple of ways of doing that for our project. And as you can see, the things that um, stand out are those um, plastic beverage bottles and uh, bottle, bottle caps. Uh, straws don't stand out as much in this particular snapshot of one day's work, but plastic pieces and foam pieces. So that micro plastics idea of um, the, um, any plastic item breaking down into tiny microscopic pieces and never going away is something that we want the students that we work with all, of all ages to, um, to get that idea and this, this activity of going out on the beach, uh, focusing on actually documenting what you're picking up, you know, putting it into a graph that you can look at later is, um, is very eye-opening and it leads to all kinds of conversations with the students um, so that we then go on and they um, come up with ideas about solutions as um, Rachel was talking about too. So this is, so, you know, um, I wanted to kind of connect what we've been doing with the sailing community. Um, and I, I uh, this was really how it, the two connected using these various apps. So the, this is the Clean Swell app uh, from the coastal cleanup that we did in September. Um, so anybody can join in any time. It doesn't have to be during a coastal cleanup effort, an annual thing. They can um, collect data from their, from their boat, from the shoreline, from anywhere, you know. Um, so I feel like this is a, some, an opportunity for many, many more people to become citizen scientists wherever they are, you know, to use this kind of app or the Marine Debris Tracker app, which is actually what we were using mostly for our project because this is a, a NOAA-sponsored um, app. I'm going to hand it back over and I'll look forward to questions later. And thank you so much. I've, it's an honor to be here. Okay. Thank, thank you, uh, Dinah. I appreciate your, your time. I know that this is, uh, I got corrected. This is not the first storm of the season uh, that's uh, churned out in the Gulf. It's, it's actually the, the fourth. Let's so see. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I've got a question for you afterwards. Uh, about the land loss in New Orleans. Susanna, are you hi. ready? Yeah. So hi, everybody. I am a, a captain as well as a chemical oceanographer and emergency manager, as Debbie said, um, which brings me into a unique situation, especially as a captain of a boat in boat yards. So often what I end up interacting with is what's the best chemical to use on a boat and what's the best chemical to use for the environment and oftentimes cleaning up things that we've put on into our boats can be just as harmful as the chemicals going um, into our environment from that spill or whatever it is so i rather than present some data that i've had it's more talking about that this is an issue we all face and that um, even those of us who, who do everything right and use plastic containers and glass containers, there are still chemicals on our boat, whether it's coolant or engine oil that are still going to be 
a problem. Um, and just thinking of that sort of dark side of new chemical technologies is that oftentimes the technology to clean them up doesn't catch up. Um, when we were doing our prep for this panel, we talked a lot about conservation tips, like how to reduce your water usage. So using things like um, salt water to wash your dishes and then rinsing them in fresh. There's all sorts of tips out there like that that you can find almost anywhere. Um, but what I really want to just start the discussion and think about um, is, do you know what's in your bottom paint? Do you know what ablative bottom paint means? Ablative means that it's meant to come off your hull so that any critters or algae gripping on fall right off. Um, do you know what oils do in our ecosystem? Um, do you know a good chemical to clean up oil that doesn't disperse it to the point where other organisms are going to consume it um, and thinking about the hazardous waste that are all around us in our boats and our systems and just doing the research to find out the best place to dispose of them and things like that. Sure. Also like your shrink wrap, is there a reusable cover you can use and things like that. So yeah, I'll turn it back over and we can do questions. Thanks, Susanna. Um, Dinah. Uh, in, in light of the storm coming in, I, one, of the, one of the things with um, the ecology of our oceans is when we have intense flooding, like New Orleans will probably have some flooding today. I'm not sure how much. I'm not there. But I, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've witnessed the aftermath of, of flooding and how everything that is uh, plastic that's in the environment gets washed into either the canals like Pontchartrain or the, the Gulf of, of Mexico. So there's, there's that plus there's the subsidence of land. So this, this problem is going to keep getting worse. Would you tell the audience a little bit about um, the the really complex problems of land subsidence and just how much land is being lost and how it's connected to uh, pollution getting into our waterways. So we've lost 2,000 square miles approximately, you know, in, since uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and so that's something like the size of Delaware. And so, you, you know, it's, we, we've lost a state's worth of of land and it's still going in, in uh, southern Louisiana. So this is a delta, it's a, it's a river delta. We're on the Mississippi River Delta and New Orleans was built in a crazy spot um, on, a, on a sinking delta and we have sea level rise. And um, so we're at or below sea level here. You know, you, you're only going to be a few feet above at any point. Um, and so that presents all kinds of unique challenges and um, what the future holds um, is, is really up in the air right now. Um, you know, everybody remembers Katrina 15 years ago, the, city, the whole city flooded because the floods uh, protection system didn't hold up. So the water came in, Lake Pontchartrain, the Gulf of Mexico just came into the city. Our coastal wetlands that surround our, um, the wall that now surrounds New Orleans. So New Orleans is a walled city. It's uh, been, been built up since Katrina. Um, but our, our coastal wetlands are really our protection too. And without them, um, we can't really continue to um, exist here. So that kind of underlines how important they are. Um, they're subsiding the whole land surface is subsiding and the sea level is rising. So that kind of gives you a quick, quick and dirty picture <laughs> without going into lots of detail. The state is doing a lot of restoration, a um, great deal of money. Um, you can probably, you can Google um, Coastal Master Plan Louisiana and learn all about that. Um, but without um, you know, addressing some of our very, very underlying, you know, big underlying issues. Um, this future is, does not look great for uh, New Orleans. 
Yeah, the, the city is definitely in peril like a lot of coastal cities. Uh, we do have some other questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dinah. Um, and Dinah is a scientist from uh, the university, let me get it right, uh, she is from uh, New Orleans and she... University of New Orleans. <laughs> there you go, thank you. I thought that you were UNO, but I wasn't positive. I don't have any more notes right now. Um, and we do have a couple of questions. The first question comes in from Barb and she's, she's asking a question that I also have thought a lot about, and that is how has the COVID lockdown impacted our ocean and its residents? And anyone that wants to speak on that? I'll give a, at least a start. Uh, well, I've been quarantined and locked down in Vermont. We're actually at the headwaters of the Connecticut and, uh, well, the White and Connecticut rivers. Um, so I've been reading a lot about this and tracking it. So one thing I've seen is that our data, Dinah, you'll likely see this as, as will we, will uh, seems to be showing the people that are doing beach cleanups that some of the uh, new pieces of equipment like masks and other types of personal protective equipment is making its way to shores. So uh, I've already seen some messaging about disposing of that properly. I've seen a little bit myself, but we go out so infrequently and I'm very rural. I'm in a mountain, there's not very many people. Um, I'm sure I, it'd be interesting to hear if other people have already seen this evidence. Um, Obviously, you've also maybe have read about some of the other uh, relatively rapid results from reduced use of waterways. Uh, that seems like it might already be getting turned around, but that was a pretty fascinating thing to see over the first sort of six to eight weeks is uh, clear the turbidity, uh, reductions in turbidity and things like that from lack of boat traffic. From the marine debris side, obviously where my main interest lies is it appears that we'll have some new categories. And I think we will add it to our data card because I don't want it to be jumbled in with what we were seeing before. Um, it'll be interesting if Ocean Conservancy does the same. We generally try to keep our data card and Ocean Conservancy's uh, compatible. So it's just some, some thoughts on, on that. I'm sure that there's going to be surprises and uh, uh, some good and some probably bad. Um, we've got another question um, for everyone. And if when you answer the question, if you'd please uh, say your name and where you're from so the audience knows who you are. What's the biggest challenge to sailing green in 2020? I can, I can start to answer that. Um, I think in terms of, you know, it comes back for me of new technologies of chemicals we can use and new ways of painting our boats and cleaning our boats and um, even rigging our boats. A lot of people don't think about all the lines and sails that we use are all made out of plastic. And so our technologies aren't green, you know, I have a friend who works for a sail loft. Everything that's in that loft is made out of plastic of one form or another. And so our technologies are just not, they're going off in one direction and the green community is going off in another. Is, is, does anyone know if there's any kind of push to go back? I know in traditional sailing and, and Susanna has a, a tall ship, is there any push to going back towards hemp lines? None at all? No, because what we've done is hemp line and, and canvas um, sails are, we're all natural fibers, but just like any natural product rot very easily. And so they don't last very long. So what happened is um, a sail maker up in Maine created a new fabric that looks and feels and acts like canvas called Oceanus but it's a synthetic weave. And the same thing happened with New England Ropes products for our line. So it's called New England Ropes Vintage. Um, and so they all look great and they last a really long time, but they're all synthetic. Well, I'm gonna give a plug here for one of my friends in New Orleans. Um, they, they started a program where they're, they're reusing retired sales 
and they're taking these sales, they're, they're packaging them up and taking them, shipping them to Haiti. And the Haitians are, are they are definitely reusing these sales. Uh, I heard one story about how they actually use the sails to make a church. It was after a tropical storm, so they, they took this, this pretty big amount of uh, plastic material and uh, made it into a kind of a portable building. And this, the uh, Haitians are also using it for uh, sustenance so that they can take their boats out and, and uh, sail out a little bit uh, to get a better catch for fish. That's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, are we really helping there? Well, yeah, because we're keeping that plastic out of the landfills and out of um, the ocean. So that's one thing. And if anyone wants any information on sales for sustenance, it's a very nice um, grassroots effort to keep the plastic of sales out of the ocean. We've got another um, question. What are some more resources for good information about sailing greener? Yeah, I'll just um, hop in and give a, a plug for um, following along with um, with more of our work. We have um, a pretty active blog on our website that we're working during this time. We're not doing as much traveling to regattas as we normally would, but we're highlighting a lot of um, green boaters and clean regatta organizers and doing some interviews on there to get some perspectives from people who are making these changes themselves on the water. Um, so yeah, if you're looking for more personal, like um, kind of journalistic, uh, recounts of how people are going sailing green, um, definitely check out our blog. And if you haven't downloaded our green boating guide, there's a lot of great resources in there as well. Uh, I actually used to have a blog back uh, quite a long time ago, but no one read it. <laughs> and I talked, I talked about plastics. And it's, it's, if we think about a piece of plastic coming into our life as something that we own, uh, I think that what it will help everybody reduce the amount of one-time plastic use. I'm going to show you something that I found this delicious gelato and ice cream. I mean, it's so good. A friend brought it over for dessert for dinner. And of course, it's in a plastic jar. It's got two pieces. It's like, okay. And I kind of rolled my eyes like, oh, I don't really want that in my life. But I found a reuse for it. And I have probably had this container and used it hundreds and hundreds of times. I also love a kind of jelly that comes in a glass jar. And after I got this plastic container from my friend and didn't know, I didn't want to throw it away. I discovered that that fits in this container just perfectly. And there's a, enough of a gap between the two items that if you add water between the two and freeze it, you put the lid on, you have like a, a little thermos i mean so Debbie, i think we need to get that gelato company to be a sponsor because we all <laughs> use those containers for everything yeah i can tell you that 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 is very very good uh and i resisted buying more because i ran out of the uh, i've got enough to last me forever and i use those when i provision my boat it keeps the food it keeps the refrigeration need down some because I've got a little bit of ice in the food, whether it's frozen or not. And it's, um, it's a little hack. Paige and I talked about uh, hacks that people have for going green. And that's something that I'd really like to have um, people send us because that's the kind of stuff that will reduce um, the amount of plastic. There, I've got a couple more questions. Joan wants to know if any sailmakers, what sailmakers are doing to go green. And we can address this again uh, for a little bit. If anyone knows of any 
progress that, that the sail makers are making to not, to use materials that can be better uh, recycled or that have a lower impact. Does anyone have any information on that? To my knowledge, sail makers themselves aren't, but they certainly are um, cooperating and trying to, like um, a local loft here donates all their old sails that the owners don't want to see bags. So it makes bags for people, so it's a reuse. So they're part of the, the cycle of using, but I'm not sure if there's a new um, manufacturing method that's a little better. Yeah, and that's a good point. These sea bags that I've got a couple and they're marvelous. Not only do they keep your gear pretty dry because there's, there's plastic, but they are also extremely durable. Uh, they last for, you know, even if they're beat up old sails, they still last for a very long time. And they're kind of cool. I've got one that has uh, uh, some of the sail hardware still on it, so you can clip things onto it. It's, it's a wonderful way to reduce um, the plastic that comes with replacing a sail. Um, we've Maybe got I have a, something to add. Okay. Okay, cool. So I, I also am not aware of specific efforts by sail makers, but I know that Sea Grant Rhode Island with URI and 11th Hour Racing, have been working on taking uh, carbon fiber boats for sure, and I think maybe carbon carbon sails as well, um, to break them back down, extract the carbon, and use it carbon fiber and use it again. Okay. Um, the one thing that we've found, uh, as I've been working on microfiber, and there being so many different industries involved, is that it's hard to get uh, sort of freight train of solutions or momentum going without the people knowing. So what I recommend is when you talk to your sailmaker or when you have a conversation, it's super friendly, super supportive, ask what's the end of life plan for this sale? What do you recommend that we do when this sale is done? Like what are the signs that it's done? And then what do you recommend we do? And are you looking into upcycling, durable, good long-term durable upcycling opportunities or making it circular? And is, can these sales be repelletized, refilamentized and turned back into new sales like they're doing with uh, PET uh, <laughs> bottles to t-shirts and stuff. So, you know, we can, we all on this call as purchasers of sales, can help push this along. So in a year or two, there might be more specifics to report. So simply asking the question of a sale maker, you know, about the in life of a sale is a step. It's gonna, it's gonna help them understand that there's a concern with their um, clients, their, their customers, and um, that will help um, help them change the way that uh, the manufacturer is done. Uh, we've got another question. It's from an anonymous attendee, and that's uh, uh, what legislative efforts are being done for cleaner waterways, and how can we help? Anybody want to take that one? <laughs> I'm happy to tackle that one again. If um, so the one that's on right now is called the Break Free from Plastic Act or the um, Udall Lowenthal Bill and uh, Ocean Conservancy has been uh, is, is one good place to get that kind of uh, information on policy and regulatory efforts that are going on. And as we know, when Congress people hear from their constituents, it does help. So there's, that's one uh, opportunity there. Um, also, I just want to put a plug in for U.S. Sailing has a uh, reach sustainability guide. And I'm going to put that in the all participants chat just as another kind of list of resources specifically about sailing. Um, and then I suppose I would reiterate the making all different types of efforts. You don't need to go from zero to 100 
and no one needs to be absolutely perfect. But if you think about all the different little things you can do, like having a conversation, a friendly conversation with your sale maker to find out end of life plan to the amazing provisioning tips that Deb Deborah added or uh, making efforts both at home on the boat, those kind of things, um, they all do add up, but certainly the more they're shared and the more they're shared with the deciders, <laughs> the better. One of our sponsors too, Boat US, also has a, a clean boating uh, whole program and they do have, they do work for legislation that will help keep our waterways green. So that's something that I'm really happy that they're a sponsor of ours, especially because they promote something that I think is very, very important. So Boat US has a whole program where they work with, with uh, the legislative branches to make laws that impact boaters and protect our, our waterway. So there's a lot of organizations that are doing work. Uh, Dana, do you know of, of any um, things that are happening grassroots in New Orleans that, I know that they cleaned up, who was it that cleaned up all of the beads <laughs> that were in the storm drains? Oh, so a big thing that's going on in New Orleans, um, when I showed that photo of the canals going out of the Lake Pontchartrain, if you can visualize Mardi Gras going on in New Orleans at the same time as a, maybe a rainstorm the next day, and um, all the little trinkets and beads being washed into the storm drains and into those drainage canals. Um, so the plastic that's produced, the tra plastic trash that's produced by um, Mardi Gras is really significant. So there's um, actually finally, after, you know, there's now enough interest to uh, start to address that, that issue. So creating uh, beads that are not petroleum based plastics, but made of materials that are truly degradable. Um, and uh, some movement back to glass, the old fashioned glass beads. Um, so alternatives and then other efforts to really clean up in a meaningful manner. <laughs> um, of course, it's a huge cleanup effort anyway, but, um, but to recycle the beads and not be so wasteful um, because it's, it's just a big street party, you know. Um, yeah. And I, I lived right where it is Parade Central. And after being there a couple of years, I was, I was kind of delighted to find out that those, a lot of the beads that they throw have been thrown before. So uh, they sweep them up and if they're salvageable uh, afterwards or if people just drop them, they go to a, a nonprofit and get recycled. I think that we have a live question from Ellie. Is that correct? Yeah, Debbie, we have someone from the audience who's joining us. Um, and so we are getting ready to have her come on in. Her name is Ella McCullough. Okay, she's a New Orleanian. <laughs> Welcome, Ella. How, how's the weather? Uh, well, you can, I'm uh, sitting here at Dolphin Island on the beach. You can see Christopher moving in behind me. We have uh, just some spotty rain showers today. The surf is up, the water is up. Um, I was uh, thinking about uh, uh, sailboats. Uh, yes, it is, uh, it is all plastic. Um, but I'd like to point out, in my defense of my sailing uh, obsession, that I use very little fuel compared to people uh, who have not done the cars and sell cars and motor cars and all cars and all those things, um, which kind of makes me feel not quite as bad um, because I'm not supporting the, uh, the uh, fuel making complex and drilling for oil. Uh, I can get by on very little fuel and possibly less. I'd also like to point out that plastic boats last a very long time. I now have three boats that I have to deal with. The youngest is 24 years old, and some of you probably have children younger than that. Uh, the middle baby is 40 years old, and the old lady is 50 years old, and there's nothing wrong with the hull uh, on any of these boats, 
We don't know how much longer they'll last, but they are going to last a long time. So, of course, my solution to everything is I need to get more people sailing. And I think if we got more people sailing as a recreational thing instead of some of these other recreational things, then there might be less pollution in the world and less less plastics in the less plastics that have to be um, dealt with, and also just uh, less fuel consumed. So that's, that's right. my solution. Everybody, go to the China. Can, can you move into the Lee? <laughs> the wind is the wind is very loud. Can you move into the Lee a little little bit, Ella? Uh, yeah, that's much better. So you were saying that to use very okay. very little fuel, and the boat is the boats are plastic. However, they are very they are not one time use. I know that you. Uh, I know exactly. the fact that you took a boat that was derelict and was pretty much bound for uh, the, <laughs> the landfill and <laughs> restored yeah. the boat. And that's the 50 year old, that boat is now 50 years old, but there's a lot of, a lot of boats out there could, that could be reused. And there's a lot of people who say they have an interest in sailing, they just, for whatever reason, don't get going with it. And I think uh, because we're using these older boats that, it's an environmentally uh, nicer way to do things. It's environmentally cleaner. And as far as recreation goes, um, there's great possibilities for it being a, a, clean, a clean type of recreation. Yeah, and I know also that the, the, the other benefit of having an old boat like that, Ella was very instrumental in taking this really beat up boat that had been used. It went through three owners and had been, is a little flying Scott. She took it where it was definitely going to be taken to a landfill if it wasn't reused and invited a lot of women. And it was sometimes it was very inspiring because there were women that came who had never held a tool in their hand ever. They came, they worked on this little boat and refurbished it. Um, I will have... Uh, a post of this little boat, Fem Fatale. It was a wonderful rescue because not only did the boat stay out of the landfill, but dozens and dozens and dozens of women learned about, there's no better way to learn about a boat than to actually tear it apart and put it back together. And so it was a fabulous learning experience for lots and lots of people save the boat from the trash heap. So that's a, that's a wonderful example of not just reusing, but reusing in a extremely positive way. So congratulations to Ellie for thinking that up. But we need more people to do this. We need more people to get into sailing and, and have that as their recreation instead of, instead of things that use a lot of fuel. Yeah, like motocross or... <laughs> oh, yeah, motocross, that's drag racing. Uh, I don't know, so many things. And we just, I don't know, it's got this, uh, it's just not promoted. Um, well, it is, we're doing a better job of promoting it for sure, but when oh, people say it, it's not for me, I tend to disagree. I think it is for everyone. Especially on small boats, sailing can be, you know, a pretty green thing once you have the the boats. So I yeah. do not believe we've got any more questions. However, uh, the next thing up, I want to thank all the panelists, uh, Dana, Susanna, Rachel, uh, Deb, Paige, wonderful information. If people need uh, more information, they can uh, reach out and we'll connect you to them. Uh, visit and check out the links that were shared in the chat and save the oceans, save the earth.